This is Hedrick Smith. The presidency is larger than life to all of us, especially when the president comes to our town. Here in the spring of 1982, Ronald Reagan visits Knoxville, Tennessee, near the hometown of then Senate Majority Leader Howard Baker. Later, Baker told me about the visit. I said, Mr. President, you're, you've kindly agreed to open the World's Fair at Knoxville, and uh, why don't you plan to stay with us over the weekend? He said, all right. And I thought, good grief. <laughs> and where is the formality? Where is the protocol? And what am I in for? And what is the little mountain town of Huntsville in for? The White House, with its imperial trappings, is about to descend on this sleepy Appalachian village, population 519, to set up a global presidential command post. Fire Chief Larry Crowley remembers. There were things happening around that was strange. One day, there's a couple of vans just pulled up and started hooking up cables, and strange folks were running around. We kind of put two and two together then and realized that things were starting to buzz. Everything went more topsy-turvy than a Tennessee mountain wingding. The Secret Service drafted Sheriff Marion Carson and every single deputy, plus all 30 volunteer firemen. Military SWAT teams combed the woods around town. To connect Reagan to any point on Earth, the local phone company installed 56 telephone trunk lines in the Baker guest house. To protect the first couple from poisoning, the White House took two settings of Mrs. Baker's dishes and dispatched them to Washington where the president's meal would be prepared. Finally, the presidential arrival from above. Three massive helicopters, one with 45 members of the press, a second with a dozen White House aides. Finally, Marine One lands on the Baker's lawn depositing the president and Mrs. Reagan, secret servicemen, even the military aide who carries the atomic weapons codes. We came down in the golf cart. It was, uh, Once the president lands, uh, Senator Baker can't wait to show off his pride and joy, the stunning view of the mountains and the new river from the porch of his guest house. Baker took me on the tour also. And the first thing I did was to take him across the room to the windows overlooking the river gorge. And I noticed that the blinds were down. The blinds are never down. And I took the cord in hand and started to pull them up. And then I noticed they wouldn't come. And I tried, as, in spite of all I could do, I couldn't get the blinds up. And I turned around to anybody who had listened and said, what happened to my blinds? By then, I was thoroughly frustrated because this was the high point of the visit, this, in my mind, for the president to see that restful and, I think, majestic view. And the Secret Service, or I think it was the Secret Service, says, well, we had to tack down the blinds to the floor. And I said, why? And they said, well, there might be a sniper over there. And I said, there couldn't be a sniper within five miles of this view. And they said, well, you never know. There's a land that is fairer than day, and the At the church, the Secret Service took no chances. It stationed three agents in the pews around the president, and one other donned a white robe and joined the choir. Well, I had uh, to be um, there, I suppose, so that from that perspective, elevated, he could look down much more easily. It seemed strange for us to have a, uh, someone in the choir that no one recognized. We knew there would be some security precautions, but all the things that they did in the last couple days amazed us. They had little ladies digging in the flower beds at church, and they were they had people looking over their shoulders to make sure they weren't planting explosives in the flower beds. Officer, can we get you to Officer, move sir. Officer, 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 Officer,
these are the frustrations of a little trip to Huntsville, Tennessee. But imagine what it's like when the president goes to Moscow or Peking. He takes hundreds of assistants with him, assistants, secretaries, even hairdressers for his wife. We see the whole panoply of the White House, the panoply of the imperial presidency, as if he were some kind of modern Marco Polo. But this is the myth. It makes the president look like a king, but he's not a king. It's a misleading impression which is perpetuated by television because it's so easy to see and to identify with the president as our national hero, as if he were all powerful. But ours is a system of shared powers, not concentrated power. It seems from the White House as if chunks of power keep floating away. I don't take orders from the Secretary of State, and I don't take orders from anybody else except the people uh, who have elected me. In 1986, Democratic Speaker of the House Jim Wright launched a push for peace in Central America, upstaging President Reagan by contacting Nicaraguan leaders directly. The White House accused Wright of poaching, acting like the Secretary of State. Well, that's a good point. When he got involved in the peace process, uh, he kind of stole the high ground from us there. When a, uh, a Speaker of the House, in effect, uh, starts negotiating with a foreign country over anything, then I think that's a bad precedent uh, and probably weakens the presidency. Every modern president faces a host of rivals for power who seize the policy initiative. In reality, we have a system of rotating prime ministers. Obviously, if there's a major problem in the country and the president or his people are not addressing it, then Congress w will address it. And in many cases, Congress takes the initiative. Grant Even Rudman junior politicians like Senator Warren Rudman of New Hampshire get in the act. In late 1985, Rudman and Phil Graham of Texas stole the initiative and the limelight with a sweeping budget reduction bill. It has passed the Congress because it is the most important item on the agenda of the American people. Well, Phil Graham and I decided to move into that vacuum. The news media followed and gave us enormous exposure. And the people around the country said, hey, wait a minute. Here, here are some guys uh, with some ideas that maybe we ought to listen to. They acted, and Reagan followed. And it does so without increasing taxes to pay for more spending. Most people don't realize how often presidents are dragged into new policies against their will. One fascinating case study, Ronald Reagan had long been an avid supporter of Philippine leader Ferdinand Marcos, a staunch anti-communist ally. Yours, Mr. President, is a respected voice for reason and moderation in international forums. But flaws were seen in that policy by a conservative Republican senator from Indiana, Richard Lugar, head of the Foreign Relations Committee, and Lugar set out to change things. An official American delegation will demonstrate our support for democracy in the Philippines. I Lugar pressed for elections between Marcos and Cory Aquino, then maneuvered the White House into naming him head of a U.S. team to monitor the election. It was a pivotal moment because uh, I, I did not realize until I got there the extent to which the world press was going to cover this thing. There were about a thousand journalists accredited. The poll watchers arrived on a day when election fever was running high. There were skirmishes between supporters of the candidates. Rocks were thrown. Foreign journalists were caught in the fray. Luger's team spread out to observe the balloting and the vote count. Luger was highly disturbed by what he saw. I agree uh, with whoever is holding up the count to free it, let it go, let us see really what is happening so that we can begin to assess really whether the will of the people has been heard. Luger's press secretary at the time was Mark Helmke. Well, this hit like a bomb because it was the first clear signal that something was wrong. Someone is apparently stopping the vote counting process because they were cooking the numbers. Luger's strategy was to use the press to build pressure for change. Uh, we've seen many scenes of wholesale fraud and abuse and all at the retail level, but the, when you begin to tamper with the whole count itself of how this thing has come out, uh, that really takes on great dimensions. But Luger's cries of foul play fell on deaf ears in the Oval Office. The two parties can come together to make sure the government works and that we can retain the historic relationship that we've had. The Observer team leaders drove to the White House upset by the news that the administration had already decided on its policy even before hearing their report. The president was there, Schultz was there, Weinberger was there, and they talked at length about what had happened. And Luger basically outlined his approach that we had 
set up to watch the machinery. It was Luger's conclusion that the machinery was tampered with, and it was his conclusion that Aquino had won. Still, the Reagan White House refused to condemn Marcos. We're concerned about the violence that was evident there and the uh, possibility of fraud, although uh, it could have been that all of that was occurring on both sides. But at the same it was a very, very unfortunate press conference. The advice that the president was misinformed. Uh, Marcos and, and those folks were running the election. Uh, the fraud and abuse was clearly there. Frustrated by White House refusal to sever ties with Marcos, Luger took his message on the road. We do not accept this result as credible. And as a matter of fact, we believe it came about predominantly by fraud. The strategy paid off. Power floated from the White House to the senator from Indiana. And when Luger said the president was, was wrong, you could immediately feel the shift on Capitol Hill of people calling into their congressmen and senator's offices saying, Luger must be right, the president's wrong, you got to support Aquino. Luger stepped up the attack, appearing on all three Sunday morning TV talk shows. Richard Luger, who headed up the U.S. Observer team during the elections, appearing on Meet the Press today, for the first time publicly called on President Reagan to ask Marcos to leave. The, the problem, I suppose, is finally saying the magic words, and that is go. Finally, Reagan caved in. Attempts to prolong the life of the present regime by violence are futile. A solution to this crisis can only be achieved through a peaceful transition to a new government. The long agony is over. We are finally free, and we can be truly proud of the unprecedented way we achieved our freedom. I think the bottom line of the Philippines is that a United States senator, a chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, changed foreign policy, essentially by himself. It was important. I felt that I win, and I think the results of that situation were important for our country. With power floating so freely in Washington, a new president must master three techniques of drawing power to himself. The agenda game, the coalition game, and the image game. First, the agenda game. Fixing the president's game plan, setting his policy priorities. Then the image game, staging presidential PR to sell the president's program to the voters, boost his public approval, and give him clout with Congress. Finally, the coalition game, biggest of them all, fitting the pieces all together. This is the actual building of alliances in Congress, forming the power networks that sustain presidential programs. The presidents who have been most successful, especially on domestic policy, are good at all three games. Franklin Roosevelt, and sometimes Lyndon Johnson and Ronald Reagan. But others, like Jimmy Carter, Richard Nixon, even Jack Kennedy, fared less well with Congress because they were good at one or two games, but not all three. When it comes to the agenda game, the president's great advantage is his ability to command center stage. But a wobbly performance can be fatal, especially as the term begins. Here's advice from President Kennedy's former aide, Ted Sorensen, for the next president. He must take the initiative. If he delays too long in filling posts and sending up messages and declaring what his national program is, that vacuum will be filled by lobbyists and special interest groups, by congressional subcommittees and staff, uh, by bureaucrats uh, within uh, his own executive branch. So if he can establish a good working relationship with Congress under which he is going to be the leader, and if he can then exercise that leadership by setting the agenda, seizing the initiative, I think he'll be off to a good start. The agenda game starts right after the election. Speed and focus are vital. A new president must choose only two or three big priorities, put off other campaign promises. In 1977, Jimmy Carter was too ambitious. Jimmy Carter got off to a, an affectionate start with the country. Uh, he was certainly well liked. There was a sense of uh, this was a, a good man coming into office, a decent man. Held Rosalind's hand coming down Pennsylvania Avenue. The problem the Carter administration encountered, and I think the, the strategic mistake they made, was they tried to do too much too quickly, and they cluttered the agenda. They made they confused the public about what they were doing. They all said, "We're confused about what this man really stands for. He's all, he's all he's all motion but no direction. There are no set of priorities." Carter's troubles can be traced to his very first day, when his staff first assembled at the White House. This is how Mark Siegel, one Carter aide, remembers that fateful beginning. 
The first thing that was said to me was that I was told it was going to be a senior staff meeting at 4 o'clock. And by 4, almost everybody was there. And, and then we, I looked down at my watch, and it was 4.05, and it was 4.08, and it was 4.10, and we're all sort of fidgeting. And, and uh, at about 4.15, uh, Bob Lipschitz, who was counsel to the president, said very shyly, he said, um, well, uh, I guess I'll call this meeting together because I'm the oldest one here and there's really no one to call it together. Uh, I was uncomfortable at that first meeting and as the meeting progressed and people started to talk, I became more uncomfortable because I saw that not only wasn't there an agenda for the meeting, there didn't seem to be an agenda for the presidency. Congress has to be told by a president, here are one or two major things to work on. Focus your attention on those, and then let's get on to some other things. We sent up welfare reform and hospital cost containment and a tax reform measure and a major energy bill and a major tax cut all to the same committees. And therefore, we confused and dispersed the uh, ability of the Congress to focus on one or two things. The Reagan team learned its lessons from Carter's mistakes and provided a model of a short, disciplined agenda. Work began even before Reagan's inauguration. The whiz kid technocrat who gave focus and thrust to the Reagan agenda was the brilliant, cunning budget director David Stockman. His task was to turn candidate Reagan's gossamer campaign promises into President Reagan's practical program. How important was David Stockman in taking Reagan's campaign statements from 1980 and turning them into a real presidential program. He was exceedingly important. He was it. Um, the, the campaign agenda was extremely abstract, as campaign agendas frequently are. The, everyone knew that the president wanted to reduce spending. Few people knew exactly how he intended to do it, including people in his own campaign. But when David Stockman joined, after the campaign, as it happened, in December of 1980, on a crash basis, he produced a comprehensive program in detail, not in the abstract. The main uh, outlines and components and general details of the plan, and within 14 days or so, the finished products all across the board, which are decisions, deferrals, and budgets. Okay, okay, now, so now okay. if you just pull together an agenda that you'd like to okay. see followed, For that let period. me have it. Yeah. I'll, get, I'll, I'll get it to Ed and make sure that he, he yeah. has it, and we'll see if we can't just get it. And that, combined with Stockman's extraordinary understanding of the legislative process, was absolutely fundamental to translating a rather abstract mandate into legislative change. Good morning, all. Everyone looks very bright and happy. Since the uh, agenda is mainly concerned with the economic program, though, try not to smile too much. <laughs> The goals that you gave us are extraordinarily difficult to reconcile, but I'm pleased to report today that we're almost there. Did you find that Reagan and Ed Meese and the people around him understood the budget realities, the political realities in Washington? They had almost no detailed knowledge uh, whatsoever. Uh, there was a vacuum of content um, masked by a kind of sweeping rhetoric as to direction and as to objective. And uh, they weren't prepared, and I think that is what uh, created the opportunity uh, for myself and the team that I had at OMB to step in and more or less write the ticket. But success in the agenda game requires not only writing the ticket, but keeping the train on track, preventing disruptions. And that takes damage control. Good morning. Can you offer your resignation? In late 1981, Stockman embarrassed Reagan with damaging confessions to Atlantic magazine writer William Grider. He admitted Reagan's tax and budget cuts had been based on grossly inaccurate economic forecasts and that Stockman himself knew his budget calculations were not sound even as he lobbied Congress. That story was heading in the direction of disaster for the Reagan administration. It was focusing the public's attention on the, the, the awesome fact that the president's fiscal program didn't add up, that the numbers were going one way on, on spending and one way on taxes, that the program was unfair, that it was geared simply to reduce the highest tax brackets, the Trojan horse. The Damage Control Brigade went into action and shifted the focus by contriving a Stockman public apology, the famous woodshed speech. But I grew up on a farm 
And I might say, therefore, that my visit to the Oval Office for lunch with the President was more in the nature of a visit to the woodshed after supper. He was not happy about the way this is developed, and properly so. He was very chagrined. Why didn't you recommend firing him? Well, because he was, uh, he was really carrying a heavy load for us at the time. We were right in, uh, we were really pretty much in the, uh, still in the midst of trying to move some of our legislative program. Uh, he had uh, a knowledge and an understanding of some of these issues that frankly, few if any others in the administration had. They accomplished their goal. They made it into a People magazine story. A real simple human interest angle, which any reporter that didn't have any notes and didn't want to do any research could handle. Uh, the prodigal son betrays his father, then he comes back and begs forgiveness and comes back to see the old man. The old man kindly but sternly says, yes, my son, but don't do it again. Reagan looks better. Things look better, but they weren't better. The final irony is that the economic problem is still with us. The price that voters pay when the White House is too slick at damage control. The greatest test of any president is the coalition game. To most people, the president is commander-in-chief, but in our system of shared powers, presidents rarely command. More often, they persuade, and it takes the power of persuasion to form the coalitions that are the engines of policy. Harry Truman lined up Republicans like Senator Arthur Vandenberg to approve the Marshall Plan of Aid to Europe. That master coalition builder, Lyndon Johnson, marshaled big Democratic majorities to pass his great society legislation. But more often, coalitions require roping together politicians of different stripes. You have to have a concept that is saleable and saleable on a broader base than just party or just interest group. You have to put together oil and water. You have to put together conservatives with liberals, each with a different reason for being for the particular process. But they have to come together or you don't get a national solution that's really going to stick. In the cases of Ronald Reagan, an outsider who embraced Washington, and Jimmy Carter, who remained an outsider, we can see what's at stake for a president in the coalition game. In this game, the president's first move must be to secure his own political base, to forge working alliances with the leaders of his own party in Congress. Jimmy Carter had trouble doing that. Jimmy Carter was elected to the White House in part because he was an outsider and he ran against the Washington establishment. But when he, when he came into office, he continued those same ideas, you know, he, he did to the, to the, down to the petty point of not giving Tip O'Neill seats to, the, uh, uh, to his inauguration in 1977 and, and, and really antagonizing the Speaker of the House, antagonizing many of the others in, in positions of power. And uh, essentially the outsider approach doesn't work when you're the insider. If you're the insider, you've got to learn to build coalitions. And uh, it may work politically for a while, but his, but his presidency began to fall apart because he didn't form those coalitions once he got here. Carter ran into problems because his staff, his Georgia mafia, stayed aloof from the Washington political community. They thought the president ought to relate directly to the people. Continuing process to try to keep the president from being isolated in a, in a world just composed of staff and uh, politicians and press, which is a very unhealthy environment, as we all know. They, they just had a chip against their shoulder against everybody. Congressmen wouldn't get their telephones uh, answered. The, the Congress had all kinds of difficulty with the staff level and the underlings in the Carter administration. Unbelievable. Unlike many presidents, Carter did not enjoy politicking Congress. Harry Truman used to lobby other politicians on the yacht Sequoia during cruises on the Potomac. But that wasn't Carter's style. He saw no advantages in small talk with the boys. Even Richard Nixon used the Sequoia, as his former aide David Gergen recalls. You would invite in some congressmen and you'd go out on the Sequoia and schmooze for an evening and have a few drinks, put your feet up, have the spouses would be there, and it was a nice quiet evening. It was a way to get along and to put down the troubles and the partisanship of the day and sit back and, and, and try to build some friendships. And Carter came in and he saw it as a symbol of wealth. It was the establishment symbol. He sold the Sequoia. Well, there are a lot of us felt that's a dumb thing to do. It's not that expensive. And it's helpful. It's a way to show that you care. It's a way to build friendships. It's a way to build trust. This city ultimately works on trust. And it's the people who can trust each other who can build something together. And that's what it, it makes the city go round.
The energy crisis was a major headache for Carter. Trained as an engineer at the Naval Academy, Carter came up with a rational textbook solution and delivered a well-crafted address. We simply must balance our demand for energy with our rapidly shrinking resources. By acting now, we can control our future instead of letting the future control us. He assumed Congress would follow his lead, as the Democratic legislature had done when he was governor of Georgia. Did Carter understand himself personally? Was he a good politician working with other politicians? No, 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 Jimmy, that's one of the things that he wasn't. I, you know, I, I remember so well, uh, he made a speech with regards to energy. And uh, I went over and I said, the speech was good now, Mr. President. I'm going to give you 30 names of people I want you to call. He says, one of the great issues of our time, he says, is energy. He says, the American people understand that. He said, the Congress is going to respond to the will of the American people. He said, I don't have to make those telephone calls. He says, that's not my nature. My speech was the right thing for America, and America knows it. I said, but that isn't the way Congress works. As bright as and brilliant as he was on, on the subject matter, on the matter of the issue, he didn't know how to operate in the political field of Washington. Ronald Reagan had far better political instincts honed in the tough two-party politics of California. And he was lucky to have Senate Majority Leader Howard Baker as his guide and ally. For Howard Baker's decision to support Reagan's program set the stage for Reagan's enormously successful first year. Do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute. Well, you know, that was a poignant moment for me as I watched Ronald Reagan stand where I had wanted to stand. And, and I heard the Chief Justice administer the constitutional oath, and then the president started, the new president started his inaugural address. We suffer from the longest and one of the worst sustained inflations in our national history. I thought, you know, he's not making these promises just for himself, but in a way he's making them for you, too, because you are the majority leader of the Senate. It's something that Republicans haven't done in a long time and you have never done, and, and, and he's making these promises for you. And I guess it was at that moment that I decided I was going to be Ronald Reagan's spear carrier. I was going to be his man in place in the Senate and carry his flag. Republican unity was the rock on which Reagan constructed his legislative coalitions. Reagan's election victory created a sense of hope and momentum, and Howard Baker rallied the troops from both wings of the party. Not since 1910, under House Speaker Joe Cannon, had Republicans voted down the line the way they did for Baker, even on a contentious issue like raising the national debt limit. Baker instilled the mentality of governing. What happened on the debt limit was freshman senators responding to the responsibility to govern. And it illustrated the difference between being the minority and being a jungle fighter and shooting from behind trees on the one hand versus being the majority, where you have to move a program and where you've got to govern and you've got to do something. You can't just not do something. Reagan and his staff built up credit with members of Congress through little favors. The way they dealt with people in a very personal way, one-on-one, -on -one, was cordial and professional um, and pleasing. Reagan stood for hours with congressmen and took pictures and allowed them to bring their favorite constituents in. He signed letters. He signed pictures. He did all the little personal things that made people like him and owe him. Tip O'Neill liked to say all politics is local. Well, you could also say in Washington that all politics is personal. And the fact that someone might uh, disagree with Reagan uh, was mitigated by the fact that they had met him and liked him personally. But any effective president needs to be politically feared as well as loved. In Washington, Reagan softened up his foes, while out in the country, his lieutenants played hardball. They blitzed swing Southern Democrats to whip them into line for Reagan's agenda. What we first did is went and analyzed each member uh, in, in, in each member's district, and uh, we had a kind of a rating scale of, of, of a one mean, uh, meaning uh, that this is the kind of guy you just go and blatantly intimidate in his district, and a five means uh, here's a guy that's been very friendly, and you really don't have to do that sort of thing, and a three was somewhere in between. We do direct mail to constituencies. Uh, Sometimes we did direct mail to, to high do donor fundraisers. Uh, for, or in some instances, we actually got 10 or 12 of a Democrat's uh, top fundraisers to do letters to him. 
One target of the Reaganite blitz was Butler Derrick, a South Carolina Democrat. The Reagan uh, uh, congressional uh, people up there apparently got in touch with a number of my uh, substantial contributors in the district over the years uh, who tend to be uh, very conservative. And I was getting calls from them. From, it was mainly the large business community, uh, but some of the small business community. I think it was something that was very well orchestrated. So how'd you know who to call? Well, I, I've been in Southern politics for a long time, and for instance of Butler Derrick, I knew them all. So I called him up and said, you know, I've got a good project for you. Would you call Butler Derrick and advise him that uh, if you believe in the president's program, that you think it'd be wise for him to support the program? And I gave him some basic gu guidelines, and uh, some of them, uh, on their own, uh, tighten the screws up uh, pretty good. Good evening. President Reagan today won the battle of the budget and the role... All of the that pressure paid the off. In the first big back. test of Reagan's budget in 1981, 63 House Democrats the broke with their party, giving Reagan the necessary margin for victory. The ayes are 253. The noes are 176. The amendment is adopted. Finally, we have the image game, the unrelenting effort to influence political perceptions. In the arsenal of presidential power, there is often no more potent weapon than the bully pulpit. The president's ability to attract the media gives him a unique platform to capture the nation's attention, to shape the public's moods, and to push his own objectives. Ronald Reagan turned the White House into Hollywood East and made the presidency his greatest role. But Reagan was hardly the first president to work PR. Franklin Roosevelt used fireside chats on radio for mass appeal. It is your problem, my friends, no less than it is mine. Together, we cannot fail. Jack Kennedy started televised news conferences and won a reputation for wit and intellect. Well, we always uh, follow the uh, Washington Daily News, and I believe that... Uh... <laughs> As Richard Nixon's chief of staff, California advertising executive Bob Haldeman refined mass marketing techniques at the White House. David Gergen, a Nixon speechwriter, carried Nixon's PR rules into the Reagan White House as Reagan's communications director. The overriding rule every day was fixing the storyline that would advance the president's policy agenda. Bob Haldeman had a rule that before any event, any public event, went on the president's schedule, that a member of the staff who proposed it had to be able to propose, tell him what the headline was going to be out of that event, what the first paragraph of the story was going to be out of that event, and what the photograph would be accompanying that event. And they all had to make sense. And if you couldn't justify the headline, the lead, and the picture, it didn't go on the president's schedule. It wasn't worth doing. And that kind of mentality carries over today to the Reagan White House. Reagan's White House team brought a level of media savvy unmatched in Washington. They engaged in trench warfare with the White House press corps day in and day out, using time-tested news management techniques. Spin control, calling network reporters right on deadline to give a White House slant to their stories. The silent treatment, strangling bad news by refusing to comment and keeping all administration officials off TV talk shows. Photo ops, getting good image play by admitting cameras but no questions in the Oval Office. Jimmy Carter's media managers tried some of the same techniques, but in the wake of Watergate, they ran into more skepticism from the press and public than the Reagan team. Our constraint uh, was not uh, some sort of moral disinclination towards uh, manipulating or managing the media, but uh, we did have a, a serious question, uh, to be uh, again frank about it, about just how much we could get away with in that sense. And it was my perception, at least, that uh, that journalism was much more sensitive to being manipulated then than they were uh, than they were uh, they were later on. The Soviet Union has been engaged in the biggest military buildup in the. To foster a positive image, the Reagan team borrowed from Madison Avenue, using presidential pollster Dick Worthlin to find the hot buttons that turned on or turned off the voters. We've actually measured uh, the public's uh, response to communications that the president has given using something that's called speech pulse. Worthlin would give 50 viewers little handheld gadgets to register their reactions to speeches or to Reagan's 1984 presidential debates with Democrat Walter Mondale. And that's where uh, the president has opposed practically every arms control agreement by every president 
of both political parties since the bomb went off. As he begins to unload on the president, uh, rather than getting a, a positive response, you can watch the pulse begin to fall with every charge that he makes. It goes down and down. And he now completes this term with no progress toward arms control at all, but with a very dangerous arms race underway. It's, in it's, other words, he's taking a, a tactic that's not working with the voters, it's not working with the viewers. That's exactly right. Worthlin applied the speech pulse to Reagan's speeches and advised the White House which slogans worked best with the public. At his urging, these power phrases turned up time and again in Reagan's speeches. My speech was about the wonder and glory of human and individual freedom. About the wonder and glory of human freedom. We know exactly which phrases uh, seem to get a positive response. And furthermore, we know by interviewing people afterward why it is they're responding as they are. And of course, that gives in turn uh, options for us when the president uh, speaks about those same topics at a, another point. Of course, the stage presence of the president is another key in the image game. Reagan, accustomed to being on stage, conveyed his ease with the presidency, but Carter showed the burdens of the job. Jimmy Carter looked as if he aged 10 years in office. I aged about 15 years watching him be president. That's what was wrong with Jimmy Carter. Every time I came in the house and turned on the news and looked at him, I said, oh, God, we must be in really serious trouble here. He wants me to turn down the heat. I mean, we, we must be close to a nuclear war here. Look at this man's face. People trash Reagan about, uh, you know, too simplistic and always smiling and optimistic. I've got news for you. That's part of leadership. And Jimmy Carter never understood that part of leadership. For lasting impact, the Reagan image team created a storybook presidency, staging events with irresistible visual appeal. Reagan at the Normandy landing, Reagan at the Great Wall of China, Reagan at the Korean DMZ, pictures the network simply had to run. In the 1984 election year, Reagan's visit to Korea was designed to project a fighting president, though Reagan himself had never seen combat. The advance man was Bill Henkel. This was a Sunday morning. And we did a we did a church service uh, right there, with the you know the armored personnel carriers, tanks. I mean, we we created the stage, and the uh, so he attended a religious ceremony. Then he in fact went and then spoke to the battalion that was there up on the um, DMZ, and he did have a flak jacket on there. You stand between the free world and the armed forces of a system that is hostile to everything we believe in as Americans. We did, in fact, do it outdoors uh, in a created environment. With the armored cars and so we kind of pulled in, so you had a, had a sense of where he was, not just in an ordinary church. Absolutely. So there's a little bit of Hollywood in that. A lot of Hollywood. A lot of Hollywood. And a lot of box office. Absolutely. Yeah. But if you look at that event itself, how much of it is real and how much of it is a playlet? In that particular case, the uh, activities up on the DMZ, I would say it's mostly playlet. Looks like a Hollywood back lot. <laughs> and isn't any more important. We clearly wanted to create a uh, an image of Ronald Reagan as commander-in-chief with these fine young Americans uh, on, the, uh, on the line with communism. It was great theater. Reagan men like Bill Henkel and Mike Deaver saw themselves as the executive producers of the evening news shows. The administration devoted some of its best minds to carefully scripting news spectaculars, deciding what images would become indelibly etched in the public mind. As an experienced actor, Reagan could make their scripts look spontaneous. We will always be proud. We will always be prepared. So we may be always free. The 1988 Moscow summit would be a natural. Some of us who covered the summit felt we were being fed a steady diet of public events in order to overshadow the lack of progress in the talks.
What's actually happened here in these four or five days in Moscow? Well, the most obvious thing has happened is that there's been a great theater, uh, a great stage setting for the world. What happens is they stage these elaborate events, the walk in Red Square. That's supposed to have been spontaneous. That wasn't spontaneous. We see an event that may take place five minutes, 30 minutes, what have you, come back and the videotape then gets put together as part of a collage, Reagan's Day. Now you very seldom in print do a story called Reagan's Day or Gorbachev's Day, but irresistibly, it is the pictures that drive us, particularly at a summit. So are you a prisoner of the choreographers as a correspondent? To a large extent, we have to take what we get. And they give us what they want from the standpoint of the storyline. Now, I can say to you, the television audience, here are the pictures, but I can tell you from my sources that there was a great deal of contention in their first meeting. And yet you're looking at smiling pictures. Who are you going to believe? Donaldson to the pictures. You're going to believe the pictures. So the eyes can lie. Well, they discovered this bunch in this White House. Not just that a picture is worth a thousand words, but that a picture is worth a thousand facts. Weeks before we came to Moscow for the summit, Marlon Fitzwater told me the storyline from Moscow would be Ronnie Reagan goes to Red Square. And that's exactly what emerged. No big arms breakthroughs, no big agreements of substance, but plenty of symbolism. President Reagan meets with Soviet dissidents. President Reagan meets with Moscow University students. President Reagan meets with Soviet writers and intellectuals. President Reagan goes for a stroll in Red Square with Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev. The whole thing was orchestrated months in advance, the same way as the Geneva summit of 1985. You remember that one. That was the fireside summit. Picking the right symbol is crucial in the image game. The fireside was the symbol the Reagan media managers wanted in order to convey warmth between Reagan and Gorbachev at their first meeting in 1985. And the symbol was picked by Henkel before they ever met. We understood all along that this was an important symbolic meeting, very symbolic. I wanted to create something where the two men could do some spontaneous activities. And to me, and it, it, it became sort of a metaphor for the whole trip, was a fireplace. I was looking for some sort of a setting that these two men could sit around a fireplace and be seen talking. Believe it or not, that was an important criteria for me. And when I discovered the Chateau Fleur d'Eau on the shores of Lake Geneva, I really hit a home run. There were the birch trees and there was this stone beach house with one whole wall of stone and fireplace. And I turned to my colleagues and said, we, we, we stopped looking, we have the place. Timing is the key to impact on television. Reagan's video managers even exploited other governments to heighten the live drama of presidential movements and to deliver it at the precise moment the networks needed it. Take the president's return from Geneva. Ronald Reagan coming home from Geneva. He arrives. Prime time news, right? Prime, not just news. Prime time. Nine, 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 oh, nine, oh, eight. Eastern time, p.m. And somebody said you even planned to have Reagan stop off in Brussels to brief the Allies in order to stall for several hours in order to come back just at prime time? Tell me about that. Uh, I don't in any way want to denigrate the importance of briefing the Allies. You know, image-wise, it would, it would be a lot more plausible to have the president doing something rather than just sitting in Geneva, you know, waiting for the appropriate time to leave. It was very easy to develop uh, an event to have the president stop in Brussels, uh, go to NATO, brief the Allies, consume just the requisite amount of time, and then fly on to Washington, get to Andrews, get on the helicopter, and be landing at the Capitol, I think, 9.02 and 30 seconds while the network anchors are beginning to introduce him as he goes to make his report to the nation. Absolutely. It has been perhaps the longest working day of this president's term. 
He's been up for about 20 hours, maybe even longer. Well, that's right, Tom. Some of his senior aides talked to him several times about whether this was a good idea to, to wake up in Geneva, fly to Brussels, and end up making a national TV appearance before a joint session of Congress at 3 a.m., uh, according to your body clock. And they, they went to the president several times uh, about it. He kept saying, yes, I'd like to do it. And so he's here tonight. You made false statements to them about your activities in support of the Contras. I did. A slick image game will not deflect every problem. The political bombshell of the Iran-Contra scandal shattered Reagan's image for many months, as well as his ability to govern. For weeks, White House news managers floundered. Eventually, they turned to the old tactic of passing the buck, sending the story elsewhere to Congress, and slowly Reagan recovered. We wanted a strategy we could, we could live with, and the value of saying we're going to give everything to the Congress and to the independent prosecutor was that we didn't put anything out of the White House that they were the people investigating this, not us. We didn't investigate ourselves. So we didn't have to worry so much about, uh, about that question of, what we, of explaining what we said. Well, basically, we didn't say anything. So that, those are the outsiders, those are the experts. Let them look into this thing. Even at less critical times, high officials, both Republicans and Democrats, worry that substance gets sacrificed to image and that honesty plays second fiddle to evasion. By early afternoon, uh, mid-afternoon, the major White House correspondents were formulating their leads. They were checking those uh, with the uh, chief of staff, uh, with Deaver, with uh, Speaks, others. And if it sounded like those leads were amounting to a generally negative picture across three networks, you know, the panic button went on in late afternoon. And uh, by the end of the day, uh, it was hard to tell what might be thrown overboard by way of people, or by way of policies, or by way of statements that totally compromised uh, your ability to move ahead in order to get the lead straightened out and made more favorable. I'm afraid both in government and in politics and elections, we have reached a point in which the system, not because anybody particularly wants it to, tends to reward uh, government officials and, uh, and politicians, candidates, who are uh, less rather than, rather than more forthcoming, uh, who are less rather than more candid, who are less rather than more available for cross-examination or interrogation on, 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 on what they're about. I don't know how we change that, as a matter of fact, but I've often said, if you take two candidates, all other things being equal, and you put them out on a campaign trail. One of them holds a press conference every day, does four or five events, on the whole responds uh, directly to questions and so forth. The other does about one speech a day, uh, has a press conference every six months, uh, that sort of pattern. The, 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 the candidate that doesn't respond will win every time. It was that kind of strategy that George Bush pursued in 1988. His campaign was long on symbols and short on substance sharper in defining the flaws of Democrat Michael Dukakis than in spelling out Bush's policies. His revolving door prison policy gave weekend furloughs to first-degree murderers not eligible for parole. I asked President-elect Bush if his hardball partisan campaign tactics would hurt him in dealing with the Democratic Congress. Well, this concept that the whole system would screech to a halt because we had a rough-and-tumble campaign, it's absolute crazy. I mean, there may be one or two people out there that harbor some personal bitterness, but I don't, and I took plenty of shots. And I don't think the Democratic leadership does. They've taken shots. They get elected every two years in the House. They run every six in the Senate. If you run for sheriff, you know how to take it, and you know how to dish it out. And you know when politics stops and when governing begins. And I've run for sheriff. If you look at the agenda, what are your, going to be your top priorities? Well, one of them has to be the federal budget deficit. And that is a top priority of the United States Congress. And it's a top priority of the administration. Then, uh, do you remember the expression, a thousand points of light? Well, I want to reinvigorate the private sector, if I can. I want to start that youth entering service program that I think bring, could help bring out the best in our young people and also 
uh, help solve some of the problems of the inner, inner cities thereby. Uh, I want to do more in education, and that means working with my Secretary of Education, formulating our proposals, getting them up to the hill. Uh, we're going to have a strong environmental team uh, under our new um, head of the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, and I'll have to spell out some priorities there. So it broad in general, the budget deficit, specific education, environment, and then clearly with an overriding concern that almost gets into the deficit category, the war against drugs. Mr. President, like listening to you, I'm, I'm both inspired and puzzled a little bit. The inspiration is clear. Uh, the puzzlement comes from this. It seems to me, listening to you, uh, I hear a few echoes of Jimmy Carter, and that may sound strange to you. I don't mean in terms very of... strange. Yeah, okay. I don't mean in terms of specific policies. What I mean is that when Jimmy Carter came in, he wanted to do something about the environment. He wanted to do something about education. He wanted to do something about the bringing taxes down. He wanted to do something about the budget deficit, and on and on. And one of the problems he had was focusing the Congress. He confused the Congress, and he confused the country. Please don't suggest to me that if I don't say that, if I throw in the question of trying to do better on fighting narcotics, that that means I'm not interested in the deficit, the one major, you know, economic problem facing us. I think to be so unipurpose that you say you're going to do nothing else until the deficit is solved is myopic. These are George Bush's thoughts rapidly approaching Inauguration Day. Somewhat surprisingly, he's still offering the same ambitious political menu that he offered during the campaign. His agenda may gain focus in the weeks ahead, but right now it sounds almost as sprawling as Jimmy Carter's was, and that got Carter in trouble. George Bush has another potential problem. Like his four Republican presidential predecessors, he faces divided government. He won the White House big, but the Democrats won control of both houses of Congress. In most of the Reagan years, that led to repeated deadlocks on defense issues, on the budget, on aid to the Contras, on social spending, and many other big issues. It ain't going to be easy. It's going to be rough. You're going to have people jumping all over me after while my budget proposals go up there. And I'm going to say, come on. Uh, this is the way the system works. Now, if you want to get something done for the country, let's sit down and talk about it. And they do want to get something done for the country, and they'll sit down and talk about it. And when somebody climbs all over me in a flamboyant thing on some program, I'll say he's doing just what he ought to do. All the voters and Michigan and Kansas or wherever he's from will think this is great. And that's what he ought to do. Now come on and let's you and me talk quietly and get this problem solved. Private bargaining is vital, but it's no guarantee of success. Other Republican presidents have tried it. Eisenhower, Ford, Reagan, even Nixon. But bargaining has often broken down because of bedrock partisan disagreement on the issues and the veto that can be exercised by the opposition as well as the White House. Howard Baker knows it well. Senator, at one time or another, either as majority leader or at the White House, you've complained about the gridlock in government. Uh, how much of this is the problem of split government, the party being uh, in the White House, the opposite party being in the House and the Senate? I think a lot of that. I think people have unconsciously decided that that's an additional check and balance to have a president of one party and a Congress of the other. But it produces gridlock more often than I like to think. I think we need to find some way to produce a greater unity of purpose between the White House and the Congress, a greater identity between presidents and the Congress, the House and Senate, in order to avoid so much gridlock that the system grinds to a halt. Howard Baker has a point. Power seems more dispersed, divided, elusive than ever. We look to one man at the top for cures, but ours is a system of shared power and a president can succeed only if he can form effective, durable coalitions, only if he and his power rivals can find common ground. The obstacles are great. In these four broadcasts, we have shown you the enormous changes that have swept through Washington and created a new power game. The earthquake in Congress, the electronic mass marketing of the constant campaign, the muscle of the lobbies, the immense influence of the unelected staff and the press, and the games of pork and turf that hobble our national defense. Our purpose has been to give you a better understanding of how Washington really works, why it doesn't work better, and why it is so vital for all of us, president, Congress, and voters, to put cohesion and common interest ahead of tactical ploys and special pleadings. 
What we're about to witness is the performance of a new leader. The fate of the Bush presidency is at stake, but much more. Our national destiny and the functioning or malfunctioning of our whole political system. I'm Hedrick Smith. Thank you for being with us.